emphasis on tropical agriculture where the, the problems are, are greatest. Um, but at the end of my talk, I will look at some of the relevance of my key points uh, to temperate agroforestry. So if we uh, start by looking at, at the familiar, um, I think we can see and we're all well aware of the uh, big success of large scale high input industrial agriculture uh, in, the, in the temperate world. Um, but the issue, I guess, is that sadly, that success uh, has not been global. And so we have these problems, the green ones here, environmental degradation and global warming and climate change being environmental, uh, and poverty, malnutrition and hunger um, being more social. Uh, and you can see that the numbers here are, are large numbers up in the billions. And I think that's demonstrating that uh, well, despite 60, 70 years of the Green Revolution, we still have a long way to go. So, oh, and we have the uh, graph that we're very familiar with of, of the onset of, of climate change uh, over the last 100 years or so. Uh, and uh, we're familiar with the, the fact that that's some 30% of that is attributed to uh, agriculture and, and to forestry. The other end of the scale is that um, we have problems with small scale, low input, uh, smallholder agriculture in the tropics. Uh, and that's arisen basically in association with the change from um, shifting agriculture to, to sedentary systems, which has arisen in association with po um, population increase uh, and cause and the fact that we have then with, within those sedentary systems, uh, very low crop yields due to the degradation of the soils. And we're going to look at the reasons behind that uh, in a moment. Um, so having said that there are failure, I guess I need to try to, to justify that. And there's some data here um, from 1981 to 2000 showing that um, in sub-Saharan Africa, 12% improvements in productivity and yield uh, re required something like an 88% increase uh, in land area. Uh, whereas um, in Latin America, um, they have made a 132% increase in yield but on 32% less land. So uh, a big difference. And Asia is, is somewhere intermediate. Two other points. Um, one is that um, about 75% of farmers themselves are hungry and malnourished at some stage in the year. Uh, and of course, farmers are the people who you would least expect to be to be suffering in that way. And I think other issues associated with this are the, the very small size of farms in Africa and the fact that a very high proportion, 80 odd percent of the population in Africa are, are, are involved in farming in some way, uh, in contrast to 1% in, in Europe or America. Um, so what's behind all of that? And uh, how can we um, think about it in more detail? I want but just to uh, raise the issues here of the inequality of, of the world um, by looking at this map. Uh, it basically shows that in the tropics, um, we have a very high proportion, something like 70%, uh, shown by the deep orange color here. 75% of the people, 70% of the people uh, living on less than $1.25 a day. Uh, and so that's what, something like $450 a year compared with $67,000 for a, a farmer in the UK. So we have a very unequal world um, with rich and poor uh, and very different um, uh, livelihoods uh, and access to, uh, to resources. So I think we, to, we need to try to get behind that information and un understand what, what the issues are. And basically, I've described that as a a downward cycle of land degradation and social deprivation, where poverty drives land degradation, 
and land degradation uh, is driving poverty. Um, and to try and put some flesh on the bones of that here in, with the, the red arrows, you, you can basically see some of the uh, complex interactions that go on between social, economic and environmental issues um, that basically are behind this downward spiral. Uh, so if we start at the top with desire for security and wealth, um, that tends to lead to unsustainable farming, deforestation, overfishing and overgrazing, all of which lead to ecosystem degradation and soil erosion, subsequently to loss of biodiversity, breakdown of ecosystem function, loss of crop yield, hunger and malnutrition, uh, and declining livelihoods. And then that feeds straight back up to the top again uh, to, to complete the, the cycle. And so this downward spiral, I think, is, is seldom really recognized and understood um, by policymakers as behind the issues of poverty, malnutrition, uh, and hunger. And the upshot of, of, of that is that basically in, in uh, much of the tropics, and particularly in Africa, we have a, a very large yield gap uh, in small-scale smallholder agriculture. What do I mean by that? It's the difference between the potential yield, that's what you, you the, the yields that you would get under research station conditions, shall we say, uh, and the actual yield that we can get in a farmer's field. Uh, and the main cause of that is the land degradation and the failure, or the access, lack of access of farmers to the inputs that they require in terms of fertilizers, uh, herbicides, pesticides, etc. So the lack of income is a major constraint uh, to the success of the green revolution in, in Africa. So we can see it in effect as a, as a form of efficiency gap uh, in terms of agricultural technology. Now, um, let's look at what we mean by yield, yield gap a bit more. Uh, here you, in this graph, you see at the bottom uh, the actual yield, something like 1.5 tons average for Africa, compared with um, a potential average yield for Africa of about seven tons per hectare. And I'm suggesting that uh, we need to fill this yield gap, and that that's more important uh, than trying to increase uh, potential yield. I guess in academia and in uh, policy organizations, the mention of low yield tends to trigger a knee-jerk reaction that obviously if you've got low yield, you need to increase yield potential. And the point I'm really wanting to make very strongly today is that if we really want to feed the world, uh, the, we don't have to look further than filling that yield gap because we can get something like uh, three, four, five, six, or even seven fold improvements in yield if we could if we could feel, fill that gap. So how can we do that? Well, there's no silver bullet. Um, we have to, I think, look at a combination uh, of possibilities. And so um, I've been suggesting in recent years that we could follow a, a three-step model. The first step is based on uh, using low-tech um, improved fallows and other forms of, of biological nitrogen fixation uh, to get to restore soil nitrogen. And that can get us about halfway uh, up this yield gap. But there, that's as high as we can go using biological um, processes. If we want to completely fill the yield gap, then I think we have to go to um, the fertilizers for, N, for P and K and, and trace elements. And that means if they can't afford to buy them at the moment, we've got to find some way of generating the income that will allow them to, to buy those, um, those inputs. So to address the yield gap, I think we've really got to reverse the whole cycle. We've now got to go from poverty driving land degradation and land degradation driving poverty to somehow getting land rehabilitation driving enhanced livelihoods and those enhanced livelihoods driving uh, land rehabilitation. 
<coughs> excuse me. So I think to achieve that, we have to simultaneously do three things. We have to restore the biological resources and natural capital. That means things like soil fertility, access to water, forests, vegetation, etc. We have to restore agroecological processes behind things like the nutrient and water cycle, pest and disease control, and we have to um, improve livelihoods. That means nutrition, health, culture, equity, income, etc. Uh, and that's where we're, we're currently failing in terms of um, agriculture in the developing world as, as using uh, the intensive high input monocultural model. So to do those three things, I think we need to build from um, the bottom. We need bottom up approaches to uh, help communities uh, to, to, to move forwards through agroforestry uh, and to build up towards a, a better global development agenda. So um, I want to just go through some of those those steps uh, and uh, look and see what what's involved and, and what we how simple it is. So basically, um, here we can see that in step one, I think we can use things like improved fallows and relay cropping and other forms where leguminous trees and shrubs are uh, grown um, to quickly restore soil nitrogen. Uh, and by quickly, I mean we can do that some, in something like two to three years uh, using uh, the, these sorts of combinations of, of trees and shrubs um, with, for example, a maize crop. Uh, and that's, so that's a relatively cheap uh, and simple process, um, uh, but it does, of course, have uh, a labor component. So if we can do that, then this first step can hopefully get us from one to two tons per hectare up to, up to four or to five tons per hectare. Uh, and thereafter, we need to generate the income to get up to the uh, seven, eight, nine tons. Uh, and in the bottom here in the circles, um, you can see that in association with that, with that change, we can also get um, a reduction in the area that needs to be um, put down to, to the staple food, the cereal crop. So the purple component of these uh, circles represents um, the cereal. And so on the left, you can see we have almost the whole farm um, growing cereals inefficiently. Uh, as we go through to step two, we can reduce the area of corn, but increase the opportunities for other uh, other crops and other uh, systems to to start to improve the farming system and diversify the farming system uh, and then if, once we've applied steps two and three uh, hopefully we can have a, an even smaller area of, of um, staple foods uh, and a greater opportunity for cash crops uh, and perhaps livestock so we're aiming to diversify the farm uh, and make it more productive at the same time so that brings us to step two, which is basically then how do we um, start to generate income? Uh, and back in the 1990s, um, when we were discussing with African farmers what they really wanted from agriculture, they said the things that they would really like to be able to cultivate are the species that they used to, to be able to gather products from natural forest. So they are, the, in effect, the, the, the traditional foods and medicines um, that people used to use in the past when, when forest was present, uh, they're now becoming a scarce resource. And so we can use those to, to diversify the farming system. And currently, there's something like uh, 50 species of this sort worldwide uh, going through uh, a domestication process. Now, the process that the ICRAF adopted at that time was a, was a, a participatory one, so a, a very simple approach to try to help farmers to help themselves. And that started with asking farmers uh, what they would actually like, which were their actual priority species locally, 
Uh, and in this case for Cameroon, you can see that they identified these five species, which you may or may not be familiar with, uh, but they're all indigenous um, fruits and nuts. Uh, and basically everywhere this question was asked around the world, farmers came up with similar sorts of answers, uh, a range of indigenous fruits and nuts, uh, and in one or two species, one or two places, also some some timber trees for, for poles and for firewood and other things. But fruits and nuts were very much the, the most common um, thing that farmers said they wanted. And so the idea then for participatory tree domestication is to help the farmers to identify the elite trees in their neighborhood, in their perhaps even in their own farmland, uh, and then to, to teach them very simple low-tech approaches to horticulture so that they can propagate their best trees by grafting and cuttings. Uh, and then they can do that for themselves. They can be the beneficiaries of that uh, and they can decide which ones they grow and how they're going to grow them and what combinations. Uh, and they can help to, they can make all the decisions uh, and be the beneficiaries uh, from their own innovations. So if we're going to do all that, then I think we have to understand that, in fact, trees are, are very like people. Uh, there are races, there are tribes, there are families, and there are individuals, and, and that creates huge variability in wild populations, so we have plenty of material to select from. Uh, and through the domestication, we can create new tree crops uh, and, the, and the markets that we need for, that, for their products. Um, and do, we do basically do this then by looking at the in the wild population and selecting uh, the elite individuals. Now that's not something we're unfamiliar with in, in humans either, because um, we have a celebrity culture uh, where we, we quite used to the concept of having um, selecting individuals for as, as Oscar winners, as sporting heroes, as Nobel Peace Prize winners, etc., beauty queens. Um, and I, I, the point I want to get across is that we can do precisely the same sort of thing uh, with our trees. And we can even perhaps look at it further by looking at the power of domestication in this example, which is the domestication of the wolf. So what we're seeing in this picture is a whole a series of uh, dog breeds. Those basically have been teased out of the wolf genome over uh, thousands of years of, of dog breeding um, and they illustrate the potential to uh, come up with different combinations of genes to move in different directions and I think we can do exactly the same thing uh, in our trees uh, for each of our tree species we can get this kind of variation uh, in this case of course it's been do done in by breeding through the sexual reproduction processes uh, in trees, uh, we have the opportunity to do it much more rapidly and simply um, using vegetative propagation techniques combined then with crossing those best cultivars subsequently. And of course, that's nothing particularly unusual in terms of horticulture. It's been going on for thousands of years uh, with apples and is citrus and, and vines, etc. Uh, and we know the sort of outcomes that we can get from that. Uh, and so we really, in this project uh, in agroforestry, decided that we would involve the local farmers, to see if we could help to improve species like this one. So this is Dacryoides edulis, known as Safu, or the African plum. And you can see uh, here it being, it being marketed, and it's marketed widely throughout the, the, the fruiting season in, in West Africa. Uh, and in the right hand diagram picture, you can see um, the variation that you find in the market. So um, th these are basically fruits from, from different trees. Uh, and you can see in the middle there are three quite big sort of pale yellowy ones selling for 250 um, West African francs. Uh, and down at the bottom, um, I think it's 22 fruits selling for, for 50 uh, francs. So the market recognizes this variation in morphology and color and shape and size, but it also recognizes that within all that, there is variation in terms of flavor and other characteristics uh, uh, of interest. 
So if there's that amount of variation available to us, that really helps enormously with the idea of being able to, to develop elite cultivars. Um, but to understand that, we felt we needed to measure and quantify that kind of variation to get an understanding of it. And so this is just a little bit of data from four different traits. And this is from fruit morphology in the top left, essential oils yield in the bottom left, medicinal properties top right, uh, and edible oils and fatty acids in the bottom right. So you can see there the big tree to tree variation in all of those things. Uh, offering opportunities for huge opportunities for um, selection of the best individuals. Now, of course, we don't normally want only one trait at a time. So for most things we're going to be looking at, uh, if we wanted a fresh fruit, for example, we would want uh, a big fruit with plenty of flesh, probably a small nut. Uh, we want the flesh to be juicy, tasty and nutritious. Or on the other hand, if we're going to select for the nuts, then we want to have a, a, perhaps a small fruit with a big, with a big nut, big kernel, a, a thin shell so it's easily extracted, perhaps high oil content or high oil quality, uh, and again, ideally nutritious. So we, there are, we can put together combinations of traits and identify what is known as an idiotype um, for selection. And I think for many of our species, we actually have the opportunity to go for uh, different idiotypes at the same time within the species. So some trees within a single species will be good for fruits. Other trees within the same species might be good for, for nuts uh, or indeed for some other completely different um, product like like um, uh, f f fodder or for uh, or human um, leaf uh, spinach kind of products. So there's again lots of opportunities and we need to try and understand how to do that and capture that. And so basically using vegetative propagation, once you've identified which trees you want and, and, and the farmers normally know on in their area, they know there's a tree down the path to the left that has this, these sets of qualities and another tree over there that has another set of qualities. They, they have that information to themselves uh, and so they can identify their best trees very easily. Once that's done using just simple techniques of, of propagating, capturing the, the genotype using grafting or marcotting, using very low tech um, propagation by cuttings in the village nurseries. Uh, we've developed systems that don't require running water, don't require electricity, uh, so it can be used in remote locations. Uh, they can do that for themselves. It doesn't actually cost much money either. Uh, and you end up down the bottom here um, with a, with a tree which has been propagated from the mature part of, a, of a, a, a wild tree. So it's captured that resource, that it's captured that genetic potential. It's also captured the um, ability to flower and fruit at an early stage. So you can see here, fruits down at the bottom, almost on the ground. Uh, and the products coming out of the trees from that cultivar then are, are uniform. So standard, horticultural technique, but being done by farmers uh, in, in the remote locations using their own traditional knowledge. Uh, and this is just the, an outline of the uh, way in which you use the mature part of the tree in order to shorten the period to first fruiting uh, and to reduce the stature uh, of the tree. Okay, so what I've been talking about so far is mostly uh, human food. Uh, as I suggested a minute or two ago, I think we can also do very similar things for uh, animal fodder. Uh, and in fact, there's very considerable opportunities for tree fodder in, in agroforestry. Uh, and it's been found to be extremely effective in small scale dairy uh, and meat producing units. And I'm not going to say any more about that purely for, for lack of time. So our third step then is once we've gone through those domestication processes, uh, we have to move towards commercialization and how to make uh, more income from, from those products. And I want to emphasize the importance that commercialization should always go on in parallel uh, with domestication. Otherwise, uh, if, if you go with one without the other, you don't make such good progress. Uh, I think in the case that we're talking about here, uh, we should start with local markets and where people are already familiar with the species, people already know the products, people already know how to handle them. 
uh, and and so it, we can get a very easy um, and a quick adoption of these ideas. So the, in the left-hand diagram here, we see a traditional market stall. Uh, as we develop uh, that with local communities, you can see in the middle uh, a, a guy, actually his name is Elvis, who um, has been packaging, drying and packaging some of the pro these products and selling them uh, and selling them to a much wider range of, of customers uh, over a wider geographic area and he's extended the shelf life. And so we have a cottage industries emerging uh, from this kind of approach. And we can already have uh, in the right hand set of photographs uh, a number of uh, products that are now appearing on regional and international markets having gone a step further uh, where we have now um, new in, new products emerging in shops uh, and in supermarkets. So what we see through this as you go up the value chain um, what we're seeing is that actually domestication becomes increasingly important uh, because as you go further up the, the, the value chain, so the, the market is requiring uniformity, they're requiring regularity of supply, uh, and they're requiring putting a high importance on, on quality. And those are all outputs um, that basically come from domestication. Uh, and as we've been saying, um, local farmers and local villagers now in association with those farmers are starting to develop small cottage industries. In the top left is a guy who's got a homemade dryer. Uh, we've got people developing nutcrackers, uh, oil presses, how to put dried products into sealed plastic bags. Low tech, again, low tech systems which are extremely effective and move, move the market forwards. OK, so um, what I've been talking about then, I think, is a, is a generic model for how we can use agroforestry to, to get these kinds of benefits. And just to um, reiterate, the first step is the rehabilitation of degraded land uh, and by, by resolving uh, soil fertility issues. Second step is the domestication and the third step, commercialization. And what we see here in this diagram is that the first step basically leads to uh, improved food security. We can get two to three fold increases uh, in, in uh, a cereal yield, for example. But that's it. The farmer then is stuck in, um, in poverty uh, and with low livelihood opportunities. Uh, and that has been, up till now, step one has been the focus of agroforestry uh, in Africa. What we're saying, what I'm saying now is that if we go a bit further, go through steps two and three, we can see that we can really start to have big impacts uh, on poverty and all the things associated with that. So the pink boxes here show that if you get as far as step three, where you've got product processing, value adding, market chain development, leading to employment opportunities, leading to entrepreneurism uh, and enhanced trade, then you come up with benefits in terms of income, empowerment of those communities, gender equity, uh, people can use the money for things like education and health, uh, and they're also spending money on improving their, their farm and village and even road transport infrastructure. Uh, I think this, this generic model is one which can be applied almost anywhere in the tropics because um, there are different species uh, with potential to, as soil improvers, and there are different species with potential uh, as, as foods and medicines and all sorts of other marketable products almost everywhere you go in the world. And there's, there's tens of thousands of species that could perhaps be introduced into agroforestry to meet the needs of different climates uh, and different socioeconomic situations. So it becomes, I think, a, a highly adaptable uh, approach which can be modified to meet the local needs. So if we start to look at what some of the impacts of all of this could be, I think we can see that if we can improve maize yields two to three fold or more, uh, then we uh, certainly by closing that yield gap, we're going to help uh, resolve straightforward hunger. If we introduce um, 
species which are local fruits and nuts uh, and leaves, then these are rich in, in micronutrients uh, and have great opportunity to be uh, used to diversify diets and to diversify uh, people's uh, nutrient in inputs uh, and can have great uh, improvements in, in their living, in their health uh, and, and uh, nutrition. Um, and we're also seeing that um, by going through these three steps, with the step one on the left here and steps two and three in, represented by the, the larger middle the photograph in the middle, that we are also diversifying the farming system. And part of that diversification is making the agroecosystem uh, function better because as you get more complexity, so you create niches for a wide range uh, of wildlife, and particularly the things that make ecosystems function, like fungi, uh, insects, um, and, and uh, a whole range of other organisms that, that are important in, in the life cycles and foods, food chains uh, of, of agroecosystems. And so we, we can move, we can see agroforestry as being a, a way of uh, creating a, a agroecological agro succession uh, that develops akin to that we see in a natural uh, in a natural system. And as we go up in scale, uh, also we, we can see that we, farming systems can develop as, as landscape mosaics uh, with more and more trees as part of those mosaics. Uh, and that can have benefits in terms of replenishment of, of groundwater, for example, of conservation of genetic resources. Uh, opportunities for expansion of, of markets. And so la at the landscape scale, uh, we also start to see benefits, which are often more than the sum uh, of, the, the, of the parts that you get at, at, the, at the plot level. And we're also building uh, on, on, on tradition and culture. And so by helping farmers to grow the species that they used to use in the past, uh, we're helping to build on that, and that's a, a major contribute, contributor, I think, to the rates of adoption that we're seeing. Farmers are really enthusiastic about uh, going this route when they understand that what they can achieve with their own species that they're familiar with. Uh, and in terms of the economics, we've already said that, that, that there are great opportunities to, uh, first of all, produce plants in their village nurseries that they can then sell, and they're making quite big money from that. Uh, you can sell the, the products. Uh, you can then develop the trade uh, and get opportunities for use, the use of small-scale credit, for example. Uh, you can start to build new businesses and opportunities uh, for employment uh, as well as the, the social things. So farmers are reporting to us that they now are, are also getting quite considerable uh, economic benefits. Just to sh illustrate that, uh, here we have data from Cameroon uh, showing that uh, the average income over a 10-year period has risen from almost zero to $28,000 uh, per community involved in this kind of approach. So that's, that's huge money for, um, for people living on who in the past have lived on uh, less than or around a dollar a day. So some of these communities that are really making uh, large amounts of money from, for them uh, and seeing that there are uh, great opportunities to, to go still further. So I think money really does grow on trees. Uh, and that's certainly what the farmers are telling us. They're saying agroforestry has improved their lives. They're able to buy fertilizers, they're able to buy a cow. The families are going to school, um, they're processing and trading, they're improving their house, they're building a well, they're building a road, they're building a bridge, uh, and the children are eating uh, better food, better quality food. But the impact which has been reported to us, which I think is the most exciting, is this one in the top left hand corner, where young people in the village communities are saying, we can now see a future for ourselves here in the village, and we don't have to migrate to towns to look for non-existent jobs. And so I think this is that, that to me is really the most important 
decision and most important impact that we're finding from this kind of approach. So people's lives really are being transformed, albeit on a, a relatively small scale at this stage, something like 10,000 farmers. On top of all that, of course, we're familiar with the possibilities of carbon sequestration as you go to landscapes like the one on the right here, with lots of trees in them, uh, opportunities to sequester carbon uh, and do that on a reasonably large scale. So we could actually uh, start to have big impacts in terms of mitigation uh, of climate change. Oops, let me find that one. Um, okay, we're back to the slides. Um, so what I guess I'm trying to get at here is that we, through this approach to agroforestry, we can get multi-factor exponential impact. So we're by diversifying the farming system, by solving the soil fertility problems, solving the income generation problems, uh, we're able to get a huge array of different um, impacts that all build up together to become something that really does transform people's lives. So I, hopefully, if you accept all of that, um, you can see that we are, we have identified in effect a, a way of reversing this cycle of land degradation uh, and social deprivation. Uh, and what now is important is how do we scale that up? Um, just to try and explain a little bit more about how we're reversing the cycle. I, the, in the background here, you see the web diagram that we saw earlier of the problem. Um, if we go through step one, you can see we get red arrows, which are, are reversing and giving a quick response in terms of restored soil fertility and function and, and improving food security. If we then go the brown and the blue arrows going through steps two and three, we are by picking up some of the other constraints, increasing nutritional security and income uh, and, and creating markets uh, and job opportunities, uh, which I think can all then lead us back to meeting the needs of people for uh, improved livelihoods uh, and uh, the wealth that they were seeking. So hopefully that illustrates that we can um, reverse this cycle. So as we draw to, uh, towards a, a close, um, what we're seeing in, in then is, I think, a, that a, a grassroots approach to rural development uh, can build from the needs of and aspirations of local communities uh, up to provide, uh, by providing appropriate skills, knowledge, and understanding, up to a form of what is now being described uh, as sustainable intensification. Uh, and so with that, um, we, we need, as I say, to, to see how we can build upon that now. I think if we can do that, if we can then generate the interaction between um, the north uh, and the tropics uh, in terms of help getting uh, international companies to be more involved in, in the uh, um, processing and value adding of some of these products, um, we can start to, to uh, soften the, the margins between, between North and South, uh, and hopefully eliminate the division um, by re reversing these, these major constraints and end up with a, with a more equal world. And I think the, there is now some evidence that this is beginning to happen. So if we look here in the left hand uh, red arrows, this is really what's been happening over time uh, through globalization. And I, I would really say that globalization is a bit of a misnomer. It should be more northernization because it's been associated really with um, the buildup of, of industries uh, using often resources from, from the tropics. And that buildup of globalization has led, in fact, to a, a, a reduction uh, in what goes on locally and the success of local li living. But what we're now starting to see is some cross fertilization between uh, those globalized companies uh, and the local. So we have a number of big companies now entering into pri public-private partnerships um, with communities 
uh, and with uh, local farmers to start tree domestication uh, and start getting the, this cross fertilization, which I think has a, will really bring about the sorts of differences that we were asking for in that last slide. And just two examples we have here the top picture of the vessel. Um, margarine is now being marketed by uh, Unilever. It's made from the kernel oil of um, Alan Brachia fruits uh, from West Africa and Tanzania, uh, and is now starting to be marketed in parts of Europe. Uh, and we have the example of Dame Le Ben's cars in, from Brazil, where all the products that are laid out there in front of the car are, are the raw materials have been produced by agroforestry systems uh, and processed uh, in, in factories in, in Brazil to create um, the, the marketable car. So we, we're getting to see a number of com big companies now entering into this kind of relationship uh, with communities uh, and with participatory processes uh, in agroforestry. So to bring things to a close, but I think I, what I've been describing then is, is an unconventional approach to agricultural intensification, one where we're get, having increased sustainability uh, brought about through agroecology uh, and income generation. And it's a bottom up, in, in fact, African designed farming system because this whole concept of domesticating indigenous trees was the suggestion uh, of, of African farmers. And hopefully uh, it is a road to progress. Now you would imagine that um, adoption of research like that would be would be fairly easy, but I think what we're seeing in in, in the tropics is it, that um, adoption is not that easy. It's not like falling down a waterfall. Uh, it's more like trying to force your way back up a waterfall. And so the, the work I'm doing now with the International Tree Foundation is trying to see how we can take this kind of uh, research outputs uh, and help communities in Africa um, to, to, to practice agroforestry and, and to get the developmental benefits uh, that we've been talking about. So I, ITF uh, is basically a charity working in Africa uh, for these kinds of developments. So perhaps I can conclude um, by saying that yes, I think we, we can heal our ailing world, but I, I'm very much less certain whether we can actually acquire the political will to make it that happen, to make the necessary changes in society. I, I'm basically finding that it, it's increasingly difficult to get up that waterfall uh, for, for a whole series of reasons. And so if, we affect, if we're basically finding we don't have political will to heal our ailing world um, as an altruistic or humanitarian act, then perhaps we need to harness things like the fear of terrorism. And I think when we saw that agroforestry is actually starting to help young people to see a future for themselves in their villages, then we are actually seeing the opportunity to in enhance social stability and through that hopefully enhance peace. And so by resolving the issues of poverty, malnutrition, hunger, perhaps some of these other issues of abandonment, feelings of vulnerability, disillusionment, resentfulness, and jealousy, um, hopefully we can see that we could have a second wave of, do of domestication focused on trees, focused on agroforestry, focused on helping the tropics rather than the temperate zone. And we can replicate what Jared Diamond reports in his book, Guns, Germs and Steel, that food crop domestication has been the precursor of settled, politically centralized and socially stratified, economically complex and technologically innovative societies. Now there he's talking about the temperate industrial world. But if we could replicate that uh, in the tropics, then I think we would be making huge progress. So. Just to finish, um, we've come back to this cycle of land degradation and, and social deprivation. Um, I think we, if we stand back and, and we can view the issues that we've been discussing from an even wider perspective, 
I think the, the cycle of land degradation and social deprivation is a consequence of years of, of global development. So the industrial history, the population growth, the domestic the globalization concepts and trade regulations that have gone with that, which have led, I think, to many aspects of social injustice, led to some of the urban migration, the unemployment and the disillusionment that we've been talking about. We can see that also in parallel with that, the industrial history has led to climate change and the impacts that it is having in terms of, of, of land degradation and water, shortage of water. If we could see that um, agroforestry and this approach to tropical agriculture could actually start to have impacts on this wider context, then hopefully we could make um, get more interest uh, from policymakers. And so if we superimpose our, our um, reversed cycle uh, within this sort of scheme, then my big dr what dream is to see if we can persuade people uh, that we can really can develop a, uh, a much less divided world, much less, less dysfunctional world, uh, where we can have a, a lot more um, in common across the north and the, and, and the uh, the tropical regions. So just to finish, I promised um, a, a couple of slides uh, on temperate systems. Um, if we can just perhaps consider some of the similarities uh, and differences. I guess the differences are that in, in, in these farming systems, we, have, we don't have anything like such a big yield gap. We have much greater access to capital and technology. Uh, and of course, we have much greater scale. Um, but the similarities, I think, are that we do have environmental issues. We have loss of biodiversity. We have pollution. Uh, we have opportunities for greater carbon sequestration. Uh, and we have um, differences, sorry, similar, uh, sorry, differences in the numbers and positions of trees um, within the landscape. Um, and the issues I think we need then to be thinking about are the ones of how do we enhance functioning agroecosystems in temperate zones? How do we reduce runoff and erosion? How do we protect rivers, banks, etc.? Uh, and in the last slide, uh, I think we can also see that there is potential for more uh, tree crops to enhance income of farmers in the temperate zone as well. Many people seem to think that if you go into agroforestry, it has to be wall to wall trees. And basically, I, that's not the case. I think we, we can see the trees uh, filling in marginal corners uh, and, and waste areas, uh, perhaps along um, hills in hillsides and along rivers. Uh, we can enhance all of that by domesticating and commercializing uh, a new set uh, uh, of tree crops. So that's it. That's what I have to try and put towards to you today as this introductory lecture to your webinar series. Uh, and hopefully, um, if you want to know more, you will find quite a lot more detail about what I've been talking about uh, in, in my book uh, illstrated here. Oh, well, thank you very much, Roger. I'm going to bring that slide back and just Over leave it up you. on the screen. Uh, thank you again. And thank you to all of our participants. Uh, I do apologize for the uh, delay and some of the audio difficulties at the outset. We're going to try to bring up um, uh, uh, a box here that will uh, facilitate. Uh, we, uh, and I, I understand that we've run over uh, a time. And for those who uh, do have to leave us due to other uh, schedule commitments, uh, uh, thank you for joining us. But we will uh, we'll stay on for a while with a, for a question and answer session. Uh, and I'm going to uh, bring up a box here. Uh, and. Uh, and uh, so if, uh, if people can see either the, the, the uh, question and answer box here, if anyone would like to type in so their, their question, we'll attempt to uh, facilitate Robert, Roger addressing it. Um, uh, please, uh, please, uh, 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 if there's any questions. Um, can uh, people see either the, the chat or the question and answer box here on the screen? Okay, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to. Yes. 
I, I think some of our participants may. Now, if you're okay. not seeing the question answer or the chat box, um, uh, you may uh, be because the presentation is in full screen mode. So if you would reduce from pre full screen mode uh, down to a, a smaller screen for the presentation, you may see the question answer and the chat box appear. So please, if there's a, anyone with any questions. Uh, well, there's there's a there's a, a great question and, and one of my own and, and uh, Tim Timothy Hornsby asking uh, how best to scale up. Uh, could we talk a bit more, Roger, about uh, um, yeah, the, the challenges for scaling up uh, some of these approaches? Uh, the, the, the book uh, outlines and details a number of excellent examples and, and case studies, but as you've mentioned, at quite uh, limited scale. Could we talk more about uh, some of the challenges in, in scaling uh, up some of these approaches uh, over a large, again, much larger scale? I'm only, I'm only really, seeing yeah. part of the questions, unfortunately. Yeah. I'm only seeing two or three words. Um, anyway, scaling up, yes. Okay, that's that's better. Oh, I still still only have four, five or six. But, um, the issues of scaling up, I I think. Um, I mean, the biggest problem is um, that, pe <laughs> that people aren't listening. <laughs> um, so perhaps we aren't putting we are, perhaps we aren't putting our our uh, messages over pro very well. Um, we also have, I think, built in resilience and resistance from agribusiness. Um, certainly, when I was involved in IAA STD, that's the International Assessment of Agricultural Science and Technology for Development, um, we, we saw a lot of resistance to agroforestry. Much of it was actually misinformed. Um, and I think, to some extent, there's a feeling of um, um, co competition between us. Um, and so what I think is important is to, is to try to get agribusiness to see that it, actually if we could, if they were to help get us over these first steps um, to, to uh, a more diversified and, and more sustainable system, then actually we would be creating two to three billion more customers for their products. So there is, there is that, I think there's that element of competition um, and, and people being fearful of their own, uh, their own businesses and their own livelihoods. Uh, and that is probably part of why we're having, having trouble getting uh, wider adoption by um, aid agencies and, well, and by uh, yeah. Well, thank you, Roger. I'm I'm going to address a few things uh, straight away. The, Lots of the, other questions the here. Session is being recorded and it should be available uh, uh, later uh, through a link uh, that we'll 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 share with people. Um, uh, the question of availability of the PDF. Well, I think well, well, that I think should be taken up uh, directly with Roger uh, separately uh, as far as the PDF of the slides. Now the next question, uh, Jim. Corbin asks about seeming that we've uh, you may have overlooked the issue of peak oil in in, in suggesting uh, the use of chemical fertilizer, and uh, I, but do you have any uh, response to to, to that uh, observation, uh, Roger? Um, well, yeah, obviously oils, uh, fertilizers. Um, uh, and many other things uh, have feedback to fossil fuels and the importance of them. I, I think that's your question. If I'm wrong, correct me. Um, the other opportunities are, of course, for things like rock phosphate. Uh, there have been op um, initiatives to try and, and, and find natural uh, fertilizers, um, but the problems there, the issues there are often availability uh, and transport. So um, in, in, in supporting moderate use of chemical fertilizers, uh, I think we're looking just at, at how to make the best opportunities of the existing situation. Um, the long-term sustainability of that, I think yes, I would accept that, is, uh, obviously is questionable, the, uh, perhaps. Nitrogen fixing trees that may be integrated in these systems, we can get the, the, the nitrogen, but the P and K are, are, are limited in just how much uh, the, those can be uh, Yeah, well, unfortunately, we can't get P and K from biological systems, uh, except except as mulch. And the problems with uh, with that is just generating sufficient organic matter <clears throat> organic matter on a small farm to be able to support 
uh, Roger, you can see there's a, a number of other questions. If there's any one in particular that you uh, would uh, like to uh, uh, address while we still have time. Um, somebody's saying, can agroforestry enhance resilience of agroecosystem, agroecological, in agroecological systems in the temperate zone? I, yes, I, I, think I the, concur the with that. Is yes. I think that's uh, something we're willing to uh, to engage with the the, the, the participant in, and that's the uh, focus of much of the work of our center here. There's a question here on sustainable intensification of coffee systems. Um, I, I've actually recently published a paper on the role of trees in agroecology, uh, it, uh, which mentions a lot about coffee and uh, and cocoa systems. And, and so yes, I'm, I'm, and mo much of my work has been in Cameroon and West Africa has been done in in cocoa systems, uh, uh, often with coffee as well. So um, yes, this all works very nicely, I think, with those systems. Which country is furthest on in Africa? Then I think the answer to that is 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 Cameroon, because that's where it, basically all this started. But it's now being done in many other places in Africa and, and indeed in the uh, Pacific. I'm intrigued and, by and Arjuna Pereira's question well. uh, about uh, the challenge of raising capital and 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 particularly on altruistic lines. And the, she, the president asks if any of these systems are being developed to attract capital on an, or a return on investment basis. And I think you touch on a few examples that, and, and in fact, do. Uh, would you care? Well, I think the, I mean, the the role of public-private partnerships um, brings in some aspects of capital for. Uh, um, for the, these approaches to agroforestry as well, um, but the the cost uh, of the sort of things we've been talking about compared with the cost uh, of um, the green revolution is, is probably quite small. And the the main cost is really in the in the uh, setting up the, the farmer training schools and the what we call rural resource centres uh, that that allow the the farmers to acquire these the skills and the knowledge that that's the main cost because the the technologies are simple and low cost uh, and the um, uh, and basically the, there's very little money given to actual farmers it's basically uh, Roger, support, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, through, looking at through uh, training the, and education. another question uh, further up from, from Michael gold and uh, it uh, it kind of uh, about changing the mindset of, of of large foundations or or being up against uh you know of, of kind of much bigger actors and yeah well I, I I've tried quite hard with with the Gates Foundation <laughs> I've sent them yeah. lots of questions and lots of emails and lots of documents um, you're very lucky if you get an answer at all. Um, usually you don't, but I did get some answers, and basically I was told that yes, they were very interested in working with farmers, um, but they weren't doing agroforestry um, as, as part of their, their goal and strategy was against the role of agroforestry. But then when you look at what at the objectives that they say they have for, for the Gates Foundation on the website, Every single objective they have is actually something that um, agroforestry can lead to. So it, it's, it's, it seems that the word agroforestry is a problem with some people. Um, I think a lot of people don't understand what it means. Uh, but I there, mean, is, you offer a very there are other constraints that I just don't understand. You, you your approach to intensification, of agricultural intensification for uh, you know, food production, you offer a very different approach and model. And but uh, is it you're encountering that it's uh, easily dismissed as from the argument of well we need to feed the world and you're you're up against a, a very a different uh, uh, much more powerful uh, vision of with the large scale agriculture genetic modification uh, approach towards intensification of agriculture for for and the, ultimately the argument well we need to feed the world so and dismissive of what what you're presenting yeah. The um, the argument for GMOs is interesting because I have nothing against GMOs um, from from a purely uh, scientific point of view. Uh, they perhaps do still need to be tested a bit more, but um, the issue 
with GMOs, to my mind, is not is is basically what the the problem that we're trying to address is not a biological problem. The problem of, of agriculture in the tropics is is down to environmental issues and social issues. Uh, and while those are the constraints, um, GMOs are, are just an irrelevance to to solving those problems. Once the yield gap is filled, then yes, GMOs could have lots of potential, just as I think they have lots of potential in 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 the in, in industrialized agriculture. But they just don't. It seem almost to sounds be like a description or a red the, herring. The problems uh, when, that we've been the real, talking about this afternoon. Uh, emphasize the real issues are social and environmental, and that's where the the uh, evidence and arguments need to be focused. Um, would you care to? Uh, would you care to address perhaps one more question? Uh, that, that would be, that's my. I can see one question there about what do I know about Willie Smith's work with sugar palm? The answer is yes. I know Willie Smith. I have known Willie Smith for a, a long time. Um, yeah, that, I, that's I was, also hoping that we might an, just, an interesting uh, approach. A, just one more minute uh, addressing Willie uh, Martin's question about scaling up the energetic youth in agroforestry. Uh, if you see uh, uh, her, her first question. Um, Question: uh, Could scaling up? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure Which if I'm understanding question, the question, but it reads as: Could scaling up, skilling the energetic youth in agroforestry best practices uh, among the rural communities? Would it boost food security, unemployment, uh, or employment health improvement? Um, well, uh, uh, if uh, if you're able to address, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. I'm sorry, uh, but uh, if you're able to address that, all right. I don't actually see the. I can't actually see that question here. But the um, the, uh, the issues around scaling up, uh, how to do that scaling up, are about how to um, expand the opportunities for for providing skills, knowledge, and edu and understanding to farmers. So it's about restoring um, agricultural ex extension services. It's about d working with NGOs and and CBOs. Um, to help them to provide the appropriate training f for um, for the farmers, that okay, that costs money, but and it, and it requires it need requires there being enough people to provide that education, and I think that that's probably the biggest constraint we have right now that um, the number of people with the appropriate skills, perhaps to to really scale up the sorts of things we've been talking about this afternoon uh, on a on a on a on a huge scale, on scale of addressing hundreds of millions of farmers, is probably we don't just don't have that that capacity in terms of numbers of people who could provide well, that I, kind I think, of education. Go ahead. Partly that the problem partly the problem there is also that academia I think has has shifted away from from basic um, basic biology, so the number of places where students can go and learn straightforward horticultural skills uh, is, is declining. Well, OK. I, I think uh, with that, uh, we've uh, addressed it nearly all of the questions that were presented. And uh, I think we can, uh, well, thank you very much, Roger. And I think uh, that uh, concludes our uh, our presentation. So I would like to thank everyone for who uh, did take the time to uh, uh, participate in today's session, to all our participants. And to you, Roger, uh, thank you very much for, for an excellent presentation. So, all right. Well, that's a pleasure. And I think perhaps I can just find, end by saying that um, I think those of you that are students and have a, have a, a, a career in agroforestry spreading out in front of you, um, I would say that well, the future that's, uh, of the world is in your hands. Well said and uh, and uh, and and forward looking. So uh, <laughs> excellent. Thank you so much, Roger. And uh, well, good day to everyone. Thanks so much.